Hello and welcome to Commodity Culture, where our goal is to make you a better investor in the commodity space. My name is Jesse Day, and before we dive in, standard disclaimer, nothing here is investment advice. Do your own due diligence. And this episode is brought to you by MoneyMetals.com, the most trusted online bullion dealer and depository in the United States. Use Money Metals for purchasing, selling, or storing physical gold and silver. Hit the link in the description below to learn more and use coupon code Jesse Day to get a $10 discount on your first purchase. And today's guest is a market analyst and trader and the editor of The Morning Navigator. We're going to be discussing the commodity space, why he thinks some mining stocks may be the next meme stocks. It's Tony Greer. Welcome to the show. Jesse, how are you doing today, man? Doing excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. And I want to start with a tweet that you made recently where you said, it was actually the end of last year, where you said gold and industrial miners are the new meme stocks. They're all going to go vertical in 2024 and nobody has them. So could you expand on that thought for us? Are you talking about the metals complex across the entire spectrum, industrial metals in particular, along with gold? Um, what, what are your thoughts? Expand on that. Yes, absolutely. So that, that's something that I saw happening at the beginning of the year that kind of coincided with a dollar slide that I think is pretty imminent. You know, it seems to me like the bond market wants to rally and rates are going to go lower. Like broadly speaking, we can get into a conversation about it for sure. Um, and there are two sides to the argument as always. But with the view that rates are going to turn slightly lower, that we have a chance to see the dollar turn lower with it since we saw the dollar, you know, bid only when we were raising rates. So I feel like if the dollar is going to back off, that if the dollar backs off and China continues to weaken, China is going to have no choice but to go to you know the next stimulus measure. That is generally something that is you know lights a fire under the base metal sector. And I just kind of had the idea, you know, I was fishing with that tweet quite a bit, which is something that I always do. Um, and I definitely got, I was calmed down. My bullishness was kind of tempered by the fact that that tweet went nuclear. You know what I mean? Like if you write positive things about gold, you get 500 likes automatically just for being nice, right? You write, you write something that's bullish, the stock market. And you literally, I'll, I'll tweet, I have 50,000 followers and I'll get like six likes. If I, if I dare write something bullish, the S and P. Right. That's like a do not write shit like that on Twitter, please. You know, so that, you know, at least allows you to stay bullish stocks. Right. That's very easy. That's very easy to understand, feel when, you know, when you when you lay out a tweet like that and it gets no attention, you can just sit here and watch stocks go up, you know. And so I was getting that feeling in the commodity stocks. And I just feel like there's a cocktail in this market you know, obviously we're not seeing it today with gold stocks backing off and the miners backing off from their highs. But, you know, there, there's a cocktail where I think that this sector is really appealing, right? To me, I, it goes with the idea that rates can back off, the dollar can back off, you know, as a kind of theme this year, you know, and I know that it's not going to be a one-way train, et cetera, et cetera. But if I can live with a lower yield and lower dollar theme, I can at least live with the idea that base metals, you know, while their inventories are kind of, you know, kind of low to medium, like kind of low to middle side of historic levels that I think can have a chance to go up. And especially if China starts stimulus. And I know that from talking to portfolio managers and clients in the market, when I suggest these stocks, everybody goes, yeah, 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 no, I don't think, you know, they'll look at my NVIDIA, right? Why do I want to look at NVIDIA? Don't you see NVIDIA? I own NVIDIA. Yeah, I don't need metals in mind. You know what I mean? So, I do get the sense that the setup is there. You know, I kind of got disappointed with the last pullback in um, copper failure. You know, we had we have the uh, the idea that China is going to provide some kind of stimulus. Copper just tried to break out, fell flat on its face again. You know, it's like the third time in the last year. So it really can't get going out of its way. But I feel like, you know, that's why everybody is kind of walking out of the ring, so to speak. Right. I'm talking about the trading ring. And that's what happens when there's nothing going on. People walk out of the ring. And then the next thing you know, there's a huge crowd in that ring because something is going on. So that tweet was a little bit speaking to that idea, trying to float the idea to see like who's got this stuff. And what's amazing is just that you get all the attention in the world on Twitter when you tweet about metals and mining. Like I think every single, I think every single human that owns a 
a ounce of gold or a, a, a physical gold coin is on Twitter watching for gold and, and metal tweets, you know? And so that tweet was really, really popular and it was a sentiment gauge for me. And when it went out and everybody, you know, was all over it, I was like, oh, okay, maybe this is a little too popular. I don't know, but I still feel like that setup is there. I could go on and on and people can push back against that, especially with the way the screens look now. And I totally get that. You know what I mean? And so very much so I'm, I'm a trader kind of looking to find the, the winning horses in the sector race every year. You know, that's kind of part of what I do, Jesse, and what my clients have come to appreciate me for is that I can get a sniff early on in the year as to how this year is going to pan out. You know, we had we had it right two years ago when tech backed off and all the and all the material stocks went higher. We had it again right last year when tech recovered. And so this year I'm kind of in the weeds trying to figure out, you know, what aside from uranium is going to go batshit crazy this year. And I haven't decided what yet. Uranium and cryptocurrency. I haven't decided what yet, but I feel like with scenarios is really positive for gold in 2024 also. So that's another reason I was bullish that um, on that metals tweet. So I don't, I don't want to keep going. I want to let you ask the questions. No, that was, that was a great summary there. And are you also bullish on the broad market at present? Because there seems to be this either or mentality out there that for commodities to rip, the broad market needs to crash. And, and as long as the S&P and the NASDAQ continue to grind higher, well, commodities aren't going to have their chance to kind of shine. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are there on the broad market as well. I would tend to, you know, that that's kind of what the market is telling us, right? I am bullish the stock market at the moment. I'm long the S&P on my view matrix since November 14th, when I thought the market sent a really clear message when we got, um, that was the middle of November, we got October CPI, that was like a tick of a, a tick either way from in line. And that was the day the bond market decided, okay, we're done with inflation theme, it is over. And the bond market took off like a bat out of hell, the stock market rallied sharply, the dollar curled over really sharply. And there were 17 sectors of the S&P that had two Sigma breakout rallies. So to me, the market is still reacting to that day when we said, when the bond market said the inflation theme, dead, over, buried for, you know, until something dramatic happens. So now we've had three CPI days since then that have all generated, you know, a kind of similar, if not sort of diminishing returns type of response where the stock market, the, the, excuse me, the bond market gets the CPI number, says, yeah, that's not inflationary at all right now, and starts rallying. Stock market says, ooh, lower rates out here. Let's take tech to the moon. You know, and that just seems like with the, with the AI tailwind and the cryptocurrency tailwind that it could be another big year for technology and things like that. So I'm bullish that stuff. And tell me the other part of the question so that I can answer it properly. I was just that that was generally the question, but also the the fact that most people out there seem to have an either or mentality when it comes to commodities or tech. I, I hear very few people who are bullish or bearish on both. It's usually one or the other. Maybe you could explore that dichotomy a little bit. Yeah, you know, I think it just speaks to that correlation that we've seen that's really sharp lately, you know, where, you know, if rates are on the rise because inflation is a problem, then portfolio managers look at natural resources stocks and metal stocks and say, oh, we got to get long some of that. That's like thematic here, right? We've got inflation in the air. We've got, you know, the Fed raising rates to try to combat it. That's when these stocks were doing fairly well. Um, and now if we're going to lower rates and we're going to be on a path, or at least the market is going to send a signal that we're expecting a lot of rate cutting next this year, it's kind of like, drop what you're doing in natural resources and buy every sector of technology, right? Because that's just the, this, that, that's what's been performing. That's what's been working, right? And we even saw the year that rates um, two years ago when kind of rates were still, you know, chugging and chugging higher, tech got killed in 2022, right? That was the great rotation trade, I called it, where everybody rotated out of technology and into natural resources that year, right? So, that can happen. The opposite can happen. But it seems like whatever the correlation has been one to one, if rates are falling, tech is flying. If rates are going up, we're fighting inflation. That's a positive. Usually there are commodities that are sending that inflationary impulse. And what's really important now as a dynamic, you know, behind the scenes of the October, November inflation data being, you know, non-existent into the end of last year, 
we've got commodities all kind of curling down to the bottom of the ranges again to start off this year as we price in this sort of, aside from natural gas and uranium, but we're pricing in this sort of deflationary malaise already that the bond market has got us set up for, right? And it goes with the narrative that all the recession bros are out there like, oh yeah, inverted yield curve, been inverted for so long, recession's coming, et cetera, et cetera. And like, I don't even know what to think about that. I don't, I don't ever sit here and predict recessions, a waste of my time. Um, and so I'm going to react to the bond markets. And if the bond market looks like it can get up and rally like it can this year, you know, maybe not sharply and everything is going to be in fits and starts. But I feel like the inflation genie is currently in the bottle. I'm looking for it to come back out because, you know, we still doubled the balance, the Fed balance sheet a couple of years ago. And we're, this is the inflation that we're living through now. So it's not going to just go away. My idea, though, Jesse, is that you know, on the first rip up of inflation, when we had $5 gas at the beginning of the Biden administration, et cetera, we got to a high print of nine and a half or nine something, right, in CPI. There's no way, in my opinion, that Jerome Powell is going to let that print get anywhere near nine and a half again. So, right, so this is my scenario is that even when inflation comes back, yeah, there might be a couple of upticks. There might be one morning you come in and, and the CPI number is, you know, five. 50, you know, 50 basis points higher than expected or something like that, um, because this inflation seems kind of politically structural. If we're going to continue to push on ele electric batteries and, and things like that, and we're going to, you know, try to get away from fossil fuels, we're going to have more and more inflation. So it's kind of structural. But my point is to come full circle is that as inflation ticks back up, I think that you're going to see Jerome Powell come with some sort of hammer. And be like, yeah, absolutely not. Are we allowing this inflation to creep back into the picture, especially if it happens this year because it's too politically toxic? So we'll get an inflation bubble up back to five and a half percent or six percent, and then they'll, you know, say something and it'll fly back down again. So that's kind of how I'm looking for things. That's, I think, why there's that dichotomy of either be long tech or be long natural resources, right? Because when the market paints that scenario of the low rates, high liquidity, tech is flying, AI is flying, Bitcoin is flying. What do you need gold for in that scenario to weigh down your account, right? So that's, I think, a, bit, a little bit about how the market looks at it. What do you need oil for at the bottom of the range, right? XLE, it's, you know, 3% of the S&P. It's been 3% of the S&P, you know, and no matter what we do, E&P is not going to become a bigger part of the S&P until we do away with this electronic battery stuff and say, okay, let's go back to fossil fuels because we know that works. So that's just some of the, some of the things going on. Nice. Yeah. I want to touch on the energy space a little bit later and get your thoughts there. And you mentioned the recession question and yeah, you're right. We're seeing people posting data, um, different indicators all the time, people claiming that it's impossible. We won't have a recession. Some people are saying it's going to be bigger than the Great Depression. And yet things keep chugging along for the time being. And everybody's expecting people swore that it would be in 2023. And now those same people are saying, well, I got it a little wrong. It's definitely going to be in 2024 now. Um, and then so you also have the bearish view on industrial metals from people in that camp because they think, well, the recession's going to hit. When it does, that's going to kill demand and industrial metals, copper, et cetera, is not going to be the place to be. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are there, what your response would be to, to people who say that. Put it this way. They, uh, you know, if we're doing an arm wrestling match for now, like if I had a little bit of an advantage when metals were on the highs, you know, those guys all showed up and rained on my parade and brought us right back to sort of an even match. Right. They're not kind of dead on the year. They're not getting killed on the year, but they are certainly kind of back in the hole that they came from. Um, and I think that that's something that I have to respect. Right. You know, I was definitely really, really excited by the Nippon steel for U.S. steel trade. You know, that's just like an M&A deal that generally can get sectors, make sectors come alive. Right. You have another a few other you know large players in the market that look at that and say, hmm, so, you know, maybe we should be partnering up with somebody else before we get swallowed or things like that. And, that, you know, that, that's generally good for to trade in a sector. It's usually good news. And then when there was kind of, you know, no, no follow through on that, there was great news in Century Aluminum. Stock rallied sharply. And so I thought that was another thing that was going to ignite the sector. And the recession bros just came back after it, you know, and it's hard to 
it's hard to sort of hold up that view that the metal stocks are going to survive when all of a sudden, you know, there's one slight lurch higher in the dollar and they all fall apart again. And you're like, oh, man, you know, like this, is, you know, this had the chance to be a trend for the year, you know, lower dollar, higher base metals, higher industrial metals and mining, the Nippon deal, Century Aluminum has good news, right? There's things starting to jump out of the gym. That's the way the scenario sets up when the sector has a great year. So I was really hoping for that. I'm a little bit on my heels right now. I got to be honest with you, right? Like a, a lack of follow through is a problem. Um, we haven't pulled back into technical danger, but we're into a place where I think it's worth buying them again. And so that's kind of what I'm working on with a couple of my clients and, and things like that. So I don't think that trade is by any means dead, uh, but it is. you have to respect the fact that they pulled back right after a huge set of headlines that, that got them going. So I'm a little bit tempered on that bullish view. Got it. I would like to get some insight into how you approach the mining sector in particular, the areas that you generally invest in. Do you look at the exploration space? Is it development producers, ETFs, royalties? Also curious on your time horizon as well. Yeah, I'm really all about you know, getting my clients into the sectors that I think are going to perform. Right. So, you know, whether that, you know, that that's how I'm looking at mining right now, where I, I still think that in this year, there's a chance that they have a decent year. I haven't thrown in the towel. I'm, I still think there's a chance they have a very good year. You know, we, we need a few things to develop. Um, and I'm really, really, Jesse, I'm, I'm not a specialist. Like, you know, I watch the big stocks in, you know, the big ETFs. You know, so but I'm generally trading XME or GDX as the vehicle of sort of where markets are going to value metals and mining stocks. You know, it, it was easy to to sort of buy the dip in gold stock. <coughs> Excuse me. It was kind of easy to buy the dip in gold stocks. Um, they were way oversold versus gold on the lows, and that's generally one of the time you know one of the signs that you look for if you're going to go ahead and take a chance. So those were easy to trade off of the lows, and then they got back into the middle of the range and failed again with gold at the highs. So that's a little bit of a disappointment to me right there in the gold miners, right? You know, gold is still above 2K, you know, a couple of bid offers away from the all-time high at 2135. In fact, it's 100 bucks away from the all-time high. And gold miners have fallen back to, you know, below 30, 28 offered, and, you know, they're about to get thrown out the window again. So that's a little bit disappointing. But, you know, I'm also, not every client is after raging performance, right? I, I talk to portfolio managers that are after you know, the best basis point of performance they can get their hands on. And I talk to family offices that kind of want their pile of money to be there in five years and 10 years later when they go back and check and look at it. Right. So it's not always about, you know, we have to be in the high flyers. Sometimes it's about I'm cool owning these metals and mining stocks or these exploration and production stocks or for a while, these uranium stocks before they took off. But it was like, I'm cool owning these because I kind of like being attached to hard assets if I'm going to go to sleep at night. And, you know, I'm okay with not having up 38% on the year because I sleep a little better with a little less volatility and I'm okay with up 10 or 15% on the year. You know, it's like, that's a very clear dichotomy between the, a lot of the, you know, I have to understand, like I have to make sure I put on the right hat when I'm talking to, clients, you know, if you're talking to individual traders and, and, and individual investors, you know, they'll trade, they'll trade C4 dynamite if you put a ticker on it on the screen, right? Like they're not afraid of anything, um, you know, but then you have some, you know, some gentlemen that you talk to that are a little slower moving and, and, you know, not as anxious to be a part of that shoot match, you know, and they kind of want to be over in the sidelines with their pile of gold and stocks and they don't want to be bothered, you know, so that's a little bit of an easy guide into those names when they're getting beat up and they're undervalued. You can always get, you know, you can always get family offices that to, you know, put some chips on the table and, and names like that. You know, if you make smart calls and, and generally we've, we've been very lucky with it. And my time frames, Jesse, just to address, address that, I'm usually looking for at least like a quarter or two of, of a, a runway out ahead of me. You know, I, I go from this kind of two week to two month time frame pretty quick. And that's just because, you know, I've noticed that from analyzing my trades, if I stay alive for two weeks, I, I usually have a chance to get into a trend and stay in a trade for quite a bit longer than that. 
you know, and usually if I get bucked off the Bronco within two weeks time, it was like, pfft, like that thing's not trading either that, or I missed the trend or something like that. So that's kind of how things morph on my book where like, you know, I think this is a good buy for the next couple of weeks here, you know, with the idea that in the, within the bigger narrative that it can be okay and maybe catch a trend from there. Like I had a, we, you know, I've been fortunate enough to go into like home builders, you know, with, with that sort of view and be like, yeah, I think they're okay for now. Like, I think rates are going to go, you know, down a little bit. And next thing you know, they're up 20%, you know, rates are falling further. All of a sudden, you know, you get some positive data out of the housing market and they're up on this trending run again, you know? And so now that's what the perfect scenario for me as a tactical trader, what I'm going to do from there is just keep moving my stop loss up below the markets until it's in the black and until it's in a smart place technically to get out. And that, that's when it goes perfectly, if you will. You know, so that kind of addresses the time frame where I go in kind of, you know, trying to stay alive for a shorter period of time and then kind of look for developments where it can become a trending trade. So you have a bit of a shorter time frame, I think, than a, than a lot of guests on this show. Um, and you mentioned trend following there. So how what, what what is it that you look at that indicates you might be able to jump on a trend? Is it strictly technical indicators that that guide you to an investment decision? No, not necessarily technical. Um, it's it's really, I guess it's associated with technical, but I call it performance indicators, right? One of one of the, I don't know, one of the ways that I make the sausage behind the behind the scenes here is that I have a spreadsheet that I built um, and have been following really closely since I started my own analysis and newsletter, right? Since I stopped working for somebody essentially where I had built it essentially to follow the markets and now I use it to really follow. But my point is that I spend a lot of time studying daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, and annual closes in things and annual performance in things, right? And sometimes sectors catch my radar just because they're positive four weeks in a row. It's like, hey, like, you know, at least that'll jump out from me. That, that'll that jump off the spreadsheet at me and say, hey, just so you know, take a look at this. This thing's up four weeks. I don't care what it is. I don't care if it's healthcare, which I know nothing about. I don't care if it's utilities. I don't care if it's uranium or tech stocks. That catches my attention, right? And so sometimes that's the first thing that happens when a move comes alive off the bottom, right? And there's nobody looking at it, right? This was a sector that was kind of asleep. And now all of a sudden it's kind of, you know, on the move. And you look at a chart and you get the idea like, wow, it's still early. You know, like this thing, this thing is just crawling out of a hole or just getting started. Like, it, you know, this headline makes sense. And, you know, so that's kind of what I'm generally hoping, you know, to look for and, and have that kind of a runway on some of the stocks. But, you know, sentiment is really important as well in this whole picture, you know, and I don't know why I don't know why I generally jump to that from time frame. I don't know if you want to go into that, but. You know, you like I said with the when you asked me about that initial tweet, it's like you know you can go on FinTwit on any given day in any given sector and kind of just do a little search down and get a good idea of how the market's looking at that, whether from the long side, from the short side, you know, whatever it is. But that's a really important thing to me. Like if everybody's bullish something and I'm 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 the late guy to the party, it's like I'm really hesitant to jump in unless something you know dramatic happens, a big shakeup of some sort. So that's kind of how I'm looking at things, Jesse. Well, when it comes to FinTwit, do you ever worry about getting caught in an echo chamber in that sense? Because like when we look at Uranium, for instance, like now Uranium's at a point on Twitter where if you just make a post that says hashtag Uranium with a fire emoji next to it, you're going to get a hundred likes and a whole bunch of retweets and everybody's going to be all in on it. But when you think about the Uranium investing community or just this group of degenerates, and I count myself among them who are just so enthusiastic about this commodity that maybe they don't represent the investment community at large. So do you ever worry that like maybe by using FinTwit as a sentiment indicator that maybe you're, you're getting inside that echo chamber? Yeah, but you do it against, you know, the, the, you know, it's kind of like my screens are, are telling me stuff here and FinTwit is just a little corner of that, right? It's not, it's not the whole picture. Um, you know, it's usually what that looks like against the backdrop of the screens, right? And, and one of the most, uh, one of the most pronounced sentiment bubbles that we were in was, I'm trying to think it was, I think it was last fall when stocks were on their ass around 37, 3600, 
right? And I'd love to look it up just to put this in front of me because Jared Dillian, hold on. Um, Jared Dillian was the one that pointed out that we were in this massive, massive, yeah, it was exactly, it was October of 2022. So it was two years ago, two falls ago. But that was the S&P had created from 4,800 to 3,600. And the bear porn was so pervasive, right? It was so easy to go around and find bears beating their chest all over the place, you know, that you were like, okay, this is when something happens, right? And then we had that day that I'll never forget when the S&P tumbled from 3,600 to 3,500 and back to 3,700 bid in the same day. And I am timestamped to that. I was like, that was it. That's a good low. That is the way bottoms are formed when the whole entire world is looking down, right? The whole world was like, ah, oh, we broke the bottom of the range. Here we go. Here comes a thousand points, one up a hundred, up 200. And the S and P rallied a thousand points from there, you know? So I'm just saying that like, you can feel like that was palpable. Like Jared Dillian was already talking about like where this is the most negative sentiment I've ever seen. Like stocks are not going to go down anymore. They're just not like, it's unbelievable. Like the, the taxi drivers bearish the S and P asking me if his 401k is going to be okay. You know I mean? That's the bottom. Um, so that's, that, that's somehow how powerful it is, Jesse, you know what I mean? So that's why you have to pay really, really, really close attention to this stuff. Like, whoa, Boeing door flies off. That's a short. That's a short down 10%, a Boeing door flying off. Down 10%, that's short. You know what I mean? Because like nobody's bearish Boeing. Like everybody loves Boeing. Boeing's a you know, commercial airliners, Apache helicopters, Chinooks. You know, it's the American fucking industrial dream right there. You know, and next thing you know, it's 20% off the highs looking like it might get zeroed out. You know, so it's just like, you know, the reaction to that stuff is, is, is really, really important to watch in terms of if you're hunting volatility, man. You know, when the sentiment bubble gets, you know, about to burst and it finally bursts, things fly out of it. So as a trader, you really, really got to be dialed in and, and, and know what that's all about and what's going on. And yeah, man, the uranium stuff, man, it's starting to look like it's starting to look like the laser eyes in crypto at 70K, you know, so. Yeah. It, it does. Yeah. And I mean, like, I, I'm, I'm probably I'm I'm overweight uranium by anybody's uh, stretch of the imagination. I'm long-term investor. So I'm actually hoping for the biggest correction possible at this point in time, because I think over the next several years, the thesis is going to play out. Prices will be higher two, three years from now than they are right now. Um, and I look, I'm, I'm hoping for a correction. I'm kind of like the opposite of a lot of the, the lunatics on, on Twitter who, who literally get despondent and dejected. I'm like, no, let's go. Let's go back down again. Yeah. That'd be great. I know what you mean. I know what you mean, but I get it. I tell you, and I, you know, I 100% agree with your view. You know, it feels like that, that, you know, it feels like a frontier sector again, which is kind of fun, you know, like it was, you know, it blew up several years ago. We know all about that and then went to zero and was literally left for dead. So it's always fun to trade a sector that is being rebirthed out of the grave, right? Like just like Bitcoin was left for dead at 17K, nobody cared anymore. Everybody stopped looking at Coinbase on Saturday morning and texting me while I was online to get bagels that Bitcoin is rallying and it's like, oh, that's got to stop, you know? And so it lived through that, left for dead and came alive again and with huge percentage returns. So that's the thing. But I, my opinion now, like as things go parabolic, I turn seller. I like you asked me what I am now. I am a bullish seller of uranium, right? Like I'm looking for the next, I'm looking for some ridiculous bullish headline where Sprott Physical Trust gaps open 10% to a new high. And then it'll be one of those things where like, you know, there's no solution for high prices, like high prices. And all of a sudden, somebody will come up with some uranium and you won't even know where it's going to come from because you don't see any being, you know, produced or whatever, but there will be a headline and somebody will say, Oh, that's where all the rain uranium is going to come from, at least for now. And things will come back to earth and then we'll get that correction that you say, but I want Jesse, I have a, I have pressure on myself to make a sale so mm -hmm. that I can really dig my heels in on that sell off that you're talking about, because I see it going like this and back down and then really getting on its feet again too you know, with a little bit more corporate interest and an institutional interest behind it. But um, I'm kind of just demanding myself that I make a good sale so that I can really dig in on the dip. I would like to get your thoughts on silver here as well, um, because in the 
sense of sentiment, because you were touching on that earlier, like I get hate in my comment section whenever I talk about silver. People are just, it seems like everybody's ready to throw in the towel. It's a manipulated market. Silver doesn't do anything. It's going to be around the $25 10 years from now, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, you name it, I've heard the comment about it. I'm wondering what you think about silver right here. Do you think this low sentiment could present an opportunity? Sure, it could. But I don't very, I put it this way. I feel like the silver market is really tough because there is a small cadre, I'll call it, of people that are convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that it is the most manipulated market of all time, right? The London bullion story, like this JP Morgan doesn't have enough silver to, you know, all this stuff has been flying around for 30 years since I've been paying attention, right? So I have this long history of watching the silver story arc you know, from, from beginning when I was on the floor of the exchanges and there was a guy named Don Nelson that was like, you know, back in the 90s, who was like 80 years old and was walking around with silver and gold coins that he couldn't give away for five and two hundred dollars or two hundred fifty or whatever they were. And literally you would like take a stack of them off the guy just to you know be like, Don, I'll take some silver coins and go ahead. Have a nice day, you know, just to get rid of the guy. Um, and that was silver at $5. So I saw that and all the excitement and saw the rally to 40, et cetera, et cetera, when gold went to, to uh, you know, 2000 in, in 2019. And we haven't seen the light of day since then. And that's why I've kind of been just hands off it in, because I've seen so many people get slaughtered just really with the full buy-in for silver and they never sell. Like silver goes from 20 to 40. That's not a sale for them. You know, they, that, that, those are the guys that are like, oh, no, no, now I'm really clutching my coins and we're, you know, going for the ride to 100. And it's like, I don't have that kind of mentality, right? So as far as silver, you know, unless silver for me gets on a horse and starts trending to where my, my spreadsheet says, well, wow, silver's up seven months in a row. That's something, Right. Like I, we haven't seen that. I don't think we're going to see that like in, until that happens. And it's a chart where I can put it on my screen and see it go from the bottom left to the top, right. With a little, very little interruption. I, I'm going to tell you that silver is just going to do what it's going to do. And I, I don't think it's a bad place to chase down risk. I think it's actually an okay place to, you know, to have an allocation if you're a family office and, you know, alongside a precious metal allocation to have some physical silver for sure. Um, but that's really the only way that I'm looking at it right now. I kind of have a noise cancellation policy. I still get DMs from the guys saying, hey, look, this bullion isn't lining up. I think there's a real shortage. I think they're hiding it. But as soon as you start telling me that, I'm turned off, right? Like I, I, I can only take the markets at face value. Otherwise, I can't trade them. And if you're telling me there's a boogeyman behind the curtain, I have no interest. You know what I mean? I really just don't have any interest. And so I, I know there may be a boogeyman there, but that's okay. That just means I'm not going to trade that thing. I, I generally, yeah, you know what I mean? Like I don't trade securities with Loch Ness monsters in them. You know, I just don't like to be in those. I just like to have something being kind of transparent. The oil market is generally very clear and transparent to me. I like trading oil. So that's kind of where I am. I, yeah, I, and that's and a perfect segue. I hope that um, answers the I've silver question. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, be, beyond a shadow of a doubt. And um, I, I did want to segue into fossil fuels here, oil as well as natural gas and coal, perhaps one of the most obscure and hated commodities out there. Are there is there any opportunity you're currently seeing in any of those three commodities? And if so, how do you personally approach those sectors? I think right now, well, put it this way. Yeah, I'll, I, I have a view on all three, you know, coal, the, le the least sharp view, I would say in coal. But I do think like, you know, just as just as we're trying to push towards electric vehicles, the U.S. is hitting record crude oil production, right? Um, it's kind of the same way. Um, wait, what was the first vehicle we were talking about? Um, oil, natural gas, and coal. Oh, and coal. Sorry, it's kind of the same way. You know, the the coal miners are surviving, and coal production is fine. And we, there's a huge demand for coal. Like that that sector, I I believe in having like in a long term allocation. And like I, we have our family office clients in a couple coal names that I think are good for long term holds. I like the trends. I'm I'm okay with the you know little bit of volatility that they have, and I think they're good stocks to be in. 
in terms of the other two, um, natural gas, Widowmaker, for real to me. And, and I still don't, I, I, I you know, it's, this is another one, Jesse, that I've seen go from two to 12, like three or four times in my life. You know, I've participated in some of that, you know, over the years. And I find it really, really difficult to make money in that commodity. I'm not saying it's impossible. Sometimes it goes really well, you know, where it's like, you know, the shortages line up and the price, you know, then you get the weather and the price goes up and you can get in and out. Um, at the moment, it seems like there's plenty of natural gas around. At the moment, it seems like it's totally weather uh, driven the price action. And so since I don't know how to trade weather, I kind of stay out of that. Right. And I'm sure there's some, you know, investing in Swanee and things like that. And some of the other big names, the big producers, I'm sure can turn out to be, you know, great trades. I'm kind of just in them via being long the energy sectors though. You know, I'm not, I'm not like looking for a natural gas stock to explode out of the blue. Um, and then what was the third, uh, commodity we just talked about? Natural gas, coal, Oil, 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 oil is a good one, right? Oil is the forbidden fruit trade right now, right? And I'll explain that. That's where we just saw oil, the beginning of the Biden administration, once they spilled the SPR, we just saw a back and forth between like 70, 75, you know, for a good year to two years in the middle of the Biden administration. It was kind of the Saudi Arabia versus the Biden SPR sale versus Saudi Arabia output cuts, right? That kept the market very balanced in the middle of the 70s. And then we got the big Saudi push, right? The big Saudi push ran right into the Hamas attacks and the peak at $95 just um, towards the end of, I guess, October and straight down from there, right back to the bottom of that range where we were trading in the middle of the Biden administration. Right. So now we're back to the bottom of seventy dollars and to, to a commodity trader. That's the forbidden fruit trade. That's the that's the commodity saying, go ahead and buy some at the bottom of the range here. Meanwhile, if you look at the chart, the trend down from the top has shown no sign of slowing, no sign of slowing, stopping or even redirecting at all. And next thing you know, you're like, yeah, let's buy some 70s at the bottom of the range at fifty five. Like. That scenario would not shock me right now. Now, do I think that we're lined up to have oil collapse like because of like weakening demand or oversupply? I don't. Like neither of those scenarios sound likely to me. That's why I don't have the trade on. But it may be a scenario where under $70, you know, it starts looking juicy where the next $10 seems obvious. You know, and it's like, well, we ain't going back to 80 right now because this just happened or something like that. But the one thing that's very obvious that I was just typing into my Slack channel, the oil market is pricing any geopolitical conflict flat to a NHL hockey game. Like it's pricing global, global geopolitical risk at literally zero. So, you know, you go on Twitter and you say, the Biden administration is leading us to World War Three. And you look at the screen and the screen's going, screen looks like peace and prosperity. Like, I, I hate to tell you, you know what I mean? But it doesn't show anything about, you know, warmongering or whatever you want to call it. I understand there's ships here, there's ships there, but the commodity market doesn't say it. And the bond market doesn't say it at all either, right? The bond, mar bond market's stable, but there is no flight to safety kind of a move on the screen where we're up four, five, six, seven days in a row because there are bombs going off. We've seen what that looks like. We know what that looks like. This ain't it. So, you know, it's very... You know, it's kind of treacherous to me to want to buy into commodities in any way when the market, not me, is deciding that we're going into this kind of deflationary gnarl. Uh, you know, we don't know what to expect. We're not getting a recession. We don't know. But commodities are offered. We'll tell you that. Rates, they're going down. It looks like that. This is the tech is the only game in town game. And we've seen this before, too. So you really got to kind of balance what the market is giving you and kind of listen to the signals right now. But it, I, it's really hard for me to to pick a commodity and say, yeah, I'm going after that one from the long side. That looks good. Aside from like gold looking pretty good still to me, you know, gold is doing the things that it needs to do for the bulls. You know, the bulls were just on their backs there with that big pullback from the highs. We made an all time high and then right back into the old range. That's dangerous, right? That's technically dangerous. And what gold just did was hold the moving averages like a rock 
and then show that it can put a large magnitude move away from moving averages to the upside. So that was key. And, and uh, for me, that was kind of gold saying like gold is OK after that pullback from the highs. So that's the only commodity that I have a kind of circle on right now, Jesse. And I don't have like huge aspirations for it. Like I don't think it's going to three or four thousand anytime quickly, but it feels like it can trade to twenty five hundred in orderly fashion. And I'm OK being in it for that slow move if that's what happens. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tony. It's been an incredible conversation. I always love hearing about people's different strategies when it comes to trading and investing. So you've provided a ton of insight. For those who want to learn more, uh, where can they find the Morning Navigator? What is that all about? Yeah, sure. The Morning Navigator is um, <clears throat> my newsletter that I write three days a week that I try to be a very quick and easy conversation about where traders should look in the morning. And it's something that I try to, I have a lot of pride in putting together where I, I, I sort of need it to be well-written every day with a couple of charts that are semi-interesting at the very least. Um, and then I have a P&L view matrix that I run where I, you know, kind of guide newsletter readers into positions with, you know, the time and, and kind of timestamp of when I would want to get in them, where my risk is, when I would want to get out, what the target is. Um, so people are big fans of that, of the view matrix. We've had a good couple of years, knock on wood. And then I have a study break section, which is just a uh, human interest section, essentially that people also like. So you can get, find my newsletter on my website, tgmacro.com under the product section. Uh, you can find me at Twitter at TG macro and any of your uh, TG macro at TG M A C R O. And any of your clients can feel free to email me or any of your listeners can email me at Tony at TG macro.com. If you have any questions about the newsletter, um, but it is trying, you know, generally it's a market publication for traders that is trying to identify, you know, three to five high conviction ideas a month, I think is fair to say. So I think we covered pretty much. Oh, and also you can sign up for my Substack at Navigator TV, which is tgmacro.substack.com. It's called Navigator TV. And I do uh, weekly recaps of the markets on video uh, there. And it's totally free. And uh, people like that as well. We've got about 4,000 subscribers right now, but it's growing a little bit lately. So people are enjoying those recaps. And that's another place you can find me. Awesome. I'll put links to all of that in the description below for people who want to check it out. Thank you once again, Tony, for coming on and sharing all your knowledge with the audience. Uh, I'm honored to be considered. And thank you so much for having the conversation with me, Jesse. That was awesome. And thank you for joining us today. As a reminder, this episode is sponsored by MoneyMetals.com. Use coupon code Jesse Day to get a $10 discount on your first purchase. Link is in the description below, and I'll see you guys in the next episode. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.